Good morning, everyone. We are going to look at the letter to the church at Laodicea this morning, starting at Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, and this is the last <clears throat> of the seven letters. If there is a church that you do not want to be, it is the church of Laodicea, but unfortunately, as you'll see and already probably already know, that Laodicea is with us today uh, in great numbers. So let's pray and we'll get to it then. Father, we ask your blessing on our study of your word this morning as we look at this last letter to the seventh church, to Laodicea. We pray that any rebuke given to that church that uh, needs to be <clears throat> Uh, applied to ourselves, um, well, that that would happen, that, and you would give us humble and teachable hearts that, uh, in any respect, that, that we are lukewarm, as the Laodiceans were, that you would show us that, and we would repent of it, and uh, that, that uh, we might honor and serve Christ and, and uh, be pleasing in your sight. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Here we are then <clears throat> to the angel, verse 14, of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich. I've prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door... I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him, grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, once again, let's go ahead and uh, pull out Kistemacher here and read what he has to say about the city of, of Laodicea. He does a good job on doing this, so here we go. <clears throat> the city, Laodicea. Laodicea was located some 43 miles to the southeast of Philadelphia, 11 miles west of Colossae, and 6 miles south of Hierapolis. Hierapolis is mentioned, he says, in Colossians chapter 4. Um, in the, and it was located in the Lycus Valley. It served as the gateway to Ephesus, due east about 100 miles, which was the gateway to Syria. Until the middle of the 3rd century before Christ, it was known as Diospolis, the city of Zeus, and Roas, R-H-O-A-S. But in approximately 250 B.C., the Syrian ruler Antiochus II extended his influence westward, conquered the city, and named it Laodicea in honor of his wife, La Laodice, I guess, L-A-O-D-I-C-E, anyway. The Romans <clears throat> entered the area in 133 B.C. and made the city a judicial and administrative center. They built a road system from east to west and north to south. 
At the crossroads was the city of Laodicea, which expanded in size, became a leading commercial center, and gained wealth and influence. Its wool industry flourished through the production and export of black wool. The manufacturing, the manufacturing of common and costly garments and the invention of an effective eye salve. It had a flourishing medical school that specialized in ear and eye care and had developed an ointment for treating inflamed eyes. Because of this ointment, the school became world famous. A devastating earthquake stu st struck Laodicea in A.D. 17. And like other cities in the province of Asia, it received financial aid from the Roman government. In A.D. 60, a second earthquake struck the city, and the Roman government offered financial aid to rebuild the city. But the city fathers sent the government a negative reply and made it known that they themselves had ample resources for reconstruction. In fact, they even contributed to the rebuilding of neighboring cities. So they were very wealthy. Antiochus the Great, also known as Antiochus III, brought some 2,000 Jewish families from Babylon to Lydia and Phrygia during the middle of the 3rd century B.C. Okay, so you see... What you got going on there is, uh, <clears throat> this is after the breakup of Alexander the Great's uh, empire. So Alexander, I, I don't know about the dates for sure, but this, this is all happening. These events are all happening in what we call the intertestament period. Between, they happened between the close of the Old Testament and then the opening of the New Testament with the arrival of, of John the Baptist preaching. Okay, so some, a lot of times that era is called the 400 silent years because there was no, God sent no prophet at all. So you got that period. Well, in that period of time, Alexander the Great does his thing conquering and then he dies and his kingdom was divided up amongst his uh, generals and they <clears throat> fought it out, and, and anyway, some of these guys and their descendants are, that's who this Antiochus, Antiochus is, and uh, so uh, one of them, Antiochus Epiphanes, I can't remember exactly which one he was, but he uh, really persecuted the Jews, and so anyway, when you hear uh, this talk here about Antiochus the Great, well, this is a, that's what it's talking about. This is before the time of Christ in maybe around 200 uh, B.C., something like that. So Antiochus the Great brought some 2,000 Jewish families from Babylon to Lydia and Phrygia during the middle of the 3rd century B.C. The city of Laodicea, which bordered these two regions, became host to many of these families and prospered. When in 62 BC, the Jews wanted to pay their annual tax for the upkeep of the temple in Jerusalem, their shipment of gold was confiscated by the Roman proconsul. Part of this shipment from Laodicea was from Laodicea and weighed more than, a, than 20 pounds. It's been calculated that the amount from Laodicea would imply a population of 7,500 adult Jewish freemen in the district. The letter to the church at Laodicea reveals nothing about a Jewish presence. You know, in the earlier church uh, letters, why you would have uh, persecution of the Christians there coming from the Jews, and, and then the Christ would refer to them as the synagogue of Satan. But here in this letter to Laodicea, there's no reference at all to a Jewish presence, which may mean, as Kistemacher goes on, which may mean that this church, like the one in Sardis, preached a gospel, quote, that was no threat at all to the Jews. And neither did the Laodicean Christians have to endure any persecution from the Gentile population, nor were there any false prophets, including the Nicolaitans, a Balaam, or a Jezebel in the church. 
The temple for the worship of Caesar occupied a central place in the city of Laodicea. The church accommodated itself to other religions, basked in material wealth, and was content to live a life of ease. They failed to press the claims of Christ, and consequently, Jesus has no word of praise or commendation for this church and similar churches that fail to proclaim the message of salvation. One last item should be mentioned in this brief survey. The water supply for Laodicea came from a distance of six miles at Hierapolis via an aqueduct. Its sources were hot springs laden with calcium carbonate, When the water arrived at Laodicea, however, it was lukewarm. Although these hot springs themselves had medicinal value and as health spas attracted the people, Jesus compares the tepid waters near the city to the lukewarm spiritual life of the Laodiceans. So there you have it. There's some of the background of the city and, uh, and the setting, as, we, as he mentioned, as we compare this letter to the letters to the other churches, uh, specifically there's no, there's no indication of any persecution, uh, whether it be from Jews or Gentiles, even though there was uh, not only a synagogue there, but there was a, uh, a temple of some kind built for, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> for the worship of uh, Caesar. When you can imagine then if if Caesar was to be worshipped, you know, Kaiser Kurios, uh, Caesar is Lord, that profession. Well, anyone that would refuse to do it because they would say Jesus is Lord, then uh, they would be persecuted, right? Well, there's no mention of any kind of persecution here in Laodicea, even though uh, Caesar worship was there. So that tells us that this church, so-called church, was had so compromised that they were no threat at all or offense at all to the community in which they, in which they lived. Um, <clears throat> well, let's look at verse 14 again. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write... The words of the Amen, Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. So Amen means true. Um, And here Jesus, as he always does, is he he selects certain appropriate attributes from the vision of him that John saw in chapter 1. And his characteristic here. <clears throat> is that he is a faithful and true witness in contrast to the unfaithful and untrue false witness that um, is happening there in, in Laodicea. So here is a, a rebuke right off, right, right at the beginning. He approaches them and in, uh, with emphasizing these attributes. Now, this phrase <clears throat> that Christ is the beginning of God's creation is, um, uh, of course, not a reference to the fact that, to any kind of notion that Christ is a created being. He, he, is, he is God. He is, he is eternal. But what this is talking about is the new creation that Christ has begun the new creation. He is the, he is the first fruits. He's the first one who's risen from, from the dead. And, uh, <clears throat> and he's telling them, I think, in that phrase, as he's identifying himself as the beginning of God's creation, is it's, an, it's another challenge to them that uh, here we go. My, my kingdom has begun. The new creation has already started, already, but not yet. And, uh, and you guys need to get on board, you see. So, um, otherwise, and well, he'll promise them a reward if they will repent uh, at the end of this letter, and we'll, we'll see that. 
I wanted to do <coughs> show you a search here in uh, use, we'll use eSword here of course and we'll do this search and we'll just put uh, Laodicea in there maybe Laodiceans possibly and we're going to tell it to search for any of the words and anywhere in the New Testament. So let's do a search here. <clears throat> All right, I'd mentioned to you that Laodicea was mentioned over in uh, Colossians. And what, we, what we're going to see here is that, <clears throat> see, John is writing this letter, what, about, about 90 A.D., something like that. Well, of course, the gospel was preached uh, the apostles, the book of Acts, and so forth, starting in uh, maybe the 50s or 60s A.D. So what we're coming into here in this letter to Laodicea is the Laodicean church uh, some 30 or 40 years down the road, okay? But if you back up here and look at the references to it earlier in the New Testament, you can see that at one time, originally, this the Laodicean church was a, an okay church, all right? It was a true church. It was uh, not what it had become. So, for instance, here, here's Colossians 2. <clears throat> for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, the Colossians, and for those at Laodicea. Let's see, what did he say? I can't remember how many, uh, Kistemacher, you know, he said that Laodicea was a certain number of miles from Colossae, the city of Colossae, maybe 40, I don't remember, something like that. But anyway, it's not that far away, but so Paul is writing to the church at Colossae here, and he's mentioning kind of a neighboring church, the church at Laodicea. I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face. So it's probable then that, that uh, Paul had never been to Laodicea, but, he is, but he's writing to them, you see. So, by the way, <clears throat> just a little side note, that verse I've thought of often when uh, we think about our online ministry, just like this one here. Here we're teaching a... Bible study online, and we've even, particularly, our church has uh, invited people to become online members, you know, we, we don't, um, I mean, there's only one or two limitations that, that an online member uh, has that, that someone that lives here doesn't, we don't, we don't, um, well, we hardly ever vote on anything in our church anyway, but, you know, let, let's say our church was going to, uh, somebody was recommended to be an elder, and so it's to say we were going to add a new elder. Well, that would require a, a vote of the congregation, and, uh, and, and so the online members, just, just the logistics of it, you realize this, wouldn't be included in the vote. I mean, they don't they wouldn't know the candidate even anyway. But nevertheless, in spite of that sort of limitation, um, we invite people to, be, to really be members of our, our church and be with us, even though we've never seen them fa face to face in, in most cases. Um, and, and we do that because it is so difficult in this day and age, to find a sound, genuine, uh, genuine church. So it's worked. It's worked very well. And and uh, sometimes, you know, you'll get people that'll uh, they'll be told by a pastor or some other professing Christian or something. It's like, oh well, oh no, 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 that you can't do that. That that's forsaking the gathering together of the saints and this sort of a thing. And so. You know that's not a that's not a church. You can't do this uh, online. Well, of course, we do it out of necessity. If uh, 
I know that anybody that's an online member of our church, if they had a, a genuine, real, sound church right there in their community where they live, they would love to be to plug in and and be and be part of it. But my point is here, my response to critics is that you know what? Uh, the Apostle Paul is doing the same thing there. He didn't have the technology that we have here. He's got his uh, uh, his writing instrument, and I was going to say paper. I'm not sure what he's writing on, but at any rate, and he writes to these, ch- these churches, the saints at, at Laodicea, and they've never seen him face-to-face in person. Nevertheless, here's... Here he's writing to them and, and ministering to them. And, and uh, I, do, I think there's just some application there that it, it's wrong to say that a ministry at a distance uh, is impossible or that it, it, can't, it can't be done and that sort of thing. You know, Paul was doing it there. Well, anyhow, um, here he is mentioning Laodicea there. And then again in, in chapter 4, for I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you, Paul's referring to one of his associates there, and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis, there's another one of those towns there in the Asian peninsula. Um, and, and, and as you see, this is all still all positive mentions of Laodicea. Again in chapter 4, give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house, okay? Give my greetings to the, the, the brothers, my brothers in, in Laodicea. Verse 16, and when this letter, and here we go again, this is Paul and the online church ministry. When this letter's been read among you at Colossae, pass it on, right? Have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. Now, that's, that one's interesting there, isn't it? Um, again, that's just a side note. But does this mean that, that Paul had written a letter to Laodicea and that he's telling the church at Colossae, now you share your letter that I'm writing to you with the Laodiceans, and you get the letter that I wrote to Laodicea, and you read it. Um, he just says, see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. I think that's what he's saying there. So, now here, now here you go. Check this out. In any, any time in church history, whenever there's some kind, it can even be a vague or oblique mention Uh, whenever there's some kind of a mention of some event or or document or something, um, some shyster guy is going to come along (laughs) and claim that he's got it. Okay, so like in the Old Testament, the wicked king Manasseh uh, apparently repented before he died and prayed. Well, sure enough, then, <clears throat> there's a document, I think, is it in the, uh, the Apocrypha, you know, that the Catholics include in their Bible. Uh, we don't, because we recognize that the Apocrypha are not Scripture. But anyway, um, I think it, it's in the Apocrypha or somewhere there. There's this book, the, the Prayer of Manasseh. Oh, here we are. This is Somebody writes this down. This is what Manasseh prayed. This is the prayer that he's referring to and so on all that. And all. So that happens all the time. I wouldn't be surprised if there <clears throat> is some claim floating around out there that here, the, oh, this is, this is this letter, the epistle to the Laodiceans. That, and, and here it is, and somebody wrote it and so forth. So anyway, you can check that out and see if that be the case. But, but isn't that interesting? I mean... And wouldn't we like to have it? But in God's providence, he didn't, he didn't preserve that for us. Otherwise, we would have in our Bible, apparently, uh, the epistle to Laodicea. And you know, he would wonder, 
oh man, I wonder what Paul wrote to them. But again, in this verse, there's no indication of admonishment there. Um, it could be, but there's no indication of it. And then we have it, of course, Laodicea is mentioned in, in Revelation. Well, my point is, in looking at all those verses, is that to realize that at one time, Laodicea, just like the other churches there, when, it, when they first started, were, um, you might say, on fire for the Lord. They're, they weren't this lukewarm business. But time had passed. Some decades had passed. And they had become sickening to the Lord. I mean, that, right? That's the language that you have here. Uh, <clears throat> because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of, out of my mouth. So, um, something really bad had happened uh, at, at Laodicea o- over time. They had, uh, had they become apostate, unbelief. Well, they're on the road to, to becoming not a church then um, at all. So, this is, this is quite, the, quite the rebuke. Um, Jesus is using this lukewarm, tepid water um, imagery that that reminds us, as we read there in Kistemacher, you know, that they were getting what originally was hot water, healing water and so forth, from carbonated water coming down from Hierapolis in an aqueduct. By the time it gets to Laodicea, then it's lukewarm. And so that's the imagery that Jesus is, is using here. You've probably taken a drink of some hot uh, beverage and, you know, found out, got it in your mouth, and it's, it's lukewarm, you know, and so um, it's kind of disgusting. You want, to ha- you want a drink to be cold or hot, right? Not, not lukewarm. So, so here's this really strong rebuke. I mean, to be told by Christ, I will spit you out of my mouth. You know, I will spew you out, out of my mouth because you're, you're lukewarm. You're not, you're not one or the other. You're not hot and you're not, uh, and you're not cold. So, over these decades, their zeal and love for Christ had cooled. That's what had happened. It had cooled. And and think about this now. This business of Christianity, so-called Christianity that is lukewarm. Christ is saying here that he would rather deal with people who are absolutely cold, you know, pagans, Unbelievers, they make no claim at all to be, to be Christians. Yeah, so they're cold. He said, I, I would, I'd rather have you be that than what you are, you see. So um, you've got cold unbelievers, right? People that don't even claim to be a Christian. You've got the Laodicean lukewarm, Right? And then you've got on fire, you've got hot, you've got zealous. Now, in, that, in those three categories, how many, which, how many are genuine Christianity? Well, it's only one. Only one, you see. It's highly questionable whether the Laodiceans anymore, were they, it had to get, gotten to a point where there's, the fire had almost died out that, Maybe we could think that maybe there's just a very small number of genuine believers left there. You know, that happens in churches over time. I remember preaching a funeral service. I've probably told you this before, but in an old Methodist church in, uh, over in the Willamette Valley near Salem. And, uh, and so I... 
I preached a sermon there, preached the gospel at the at the funeral, and afterwards, an old older guy came up to me, and he'd been a member of that church for a long time, and he thanked me for the sermon, and he said that that was, it had been a long time since the gospel had been preached in, in that church, you see. So over time, you've got this, this structure that professes to be Christianity, church building, you know, the sanctuary, some kind of preacher on Sunday, people gathering together there on, on Sundays. And it, so it's got this uh, appearance, it's got this form, as Paul calls it, you know, the form of godliness, but it's a denial of its power. The power of Christ is not there. And what happens is over time, then it can happen that because the gospel's not being preached, Christ isn't being obeyed, evil is not being put out of the church. Um, by the way, you notice here, there's no mention of a Jezebel or any, uh, you know, the Nicolaitans and those false teachings. So, hey, Satan is kind of like, hey, I don't need to worry about the Laodiceans. I don't need to send my emissaries there. These guys are already just about toast. So, um, but here you have it. This is a form of godliness, but a denial of its power, a denial of, of, uh, of Christianity, you see. That's this, that's this lukewarm business, and it sneaks up on people because over time, well, when, when a church compromises with the world, which these guys had done, as we'll see some more here in a moment, um, they're compromised with the world. And in that compromise, they fail to preach the gospel. Specifically, they fail to, to uh, declare that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. Um, they, they preach the gospel, which as Paul told the Corinthians, is foolishness to the world. world, It's detestable. And Christ said that his people would be hated by the world. None of that is happening here in, uh, in Laodicea. So over time, what was going on because of these compromises, uh, people aren't being told, you must be born again. So those who were born again, as the years go by, they grow older and they die and, and so forth. There's fewer and fewer and fewer genuine believers there. And it seems like that's the state that, that the church at Laodicea was out. The, the last spark of life there was about to go out. And, and so Christ comes to them and here's, here's one last of the last chances for, for these people, right? Because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, now look at, now this is, the, that, that's Christ's view. Of, that's the truth about this church, right? You're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth, all right? But what were they saying about themselves? Well, here it is. For you say, for you say, in contrast to what I say, you say, I'm rich, I've prospered, and I need nothing. And Christ says, you, you, you know, you're blind. You don't even realize that, in fact, you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself. And the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may so that you may see. So what a contrast, huh? You have Christ telling them, This is who you are, lukewarm, you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. And then you have their evaluation of themselves. Oh, I, I'm rich. I've prospered. I don't need I don't need anything, you see. Um, <clears throat> so that's what had happened. That's what they had become. 
they were living in a very wealthy, comfy society. Apparently, uh, you know, the, everybody's showing up on Sunday and, and uh, dressed in their finery because, you know, their, their textile industry there at Laodicea was, was famous. Um, they had their famous eye salve and medicine. And boy, they're on, they're on the cutting edge of, of technology there. Um, everything just coming up roses for this so-called church. And yet Christ tells them, I mean, this is incredible, isn't it? Here's this, the seventh letter that's been written. And he's like, you are the worst of the worst. You are the worst one. You know, if we're going to rate the churches of of Asia, these seven, you're right. You're you're in last place down here. Now, what he does is he he tells them that um, well, actually, maybe maybe at this point I'll read you this. Um, I got a couple of emails from people, some of our online members, commenting on the contemporary church today, and it goes right along. I mean, it's here's, these are examples of Laodicea today, all right? Laodicea is with us big time. Here's, just think of people coming to their church on Sunday morning and, and uh, getting out of their nice car. You know, how are they, you know, pretty proud of how their, their appearance and so forth. Everything's just coming up roses for them. Anyway, here's the first uh, email I got. We just watched the Revelation Bible study on the letter to the church at Sardis. And you were talking about churches dying and the causes of that. One thing that came to mind about churches that are dead on the inside but look active, I mean, they have lots of programs for outreach, programs and programs. You can't imagine the programs. My former home church had so many programs. They even had a rebranding emphasis. That is to say, you know, they're going to, we're going to rebrand our our image to the community. So they took that pesky Bible verse out that was their church motto, 2 Timothy 2.15, and they paid a public relations consulting agency to come up with a slogan, right? And so instead of having a a verse from Scripture about preaching the Word and so on, um, they take that down. They're going to remove that from their publications and maybe their church sign and so on. Remove that, and they're going to replace it with a slogan that they paid a PR firm to come up with. That, I mean, <laughs> that just makes you shake your head, right? I mean, what would you tell a church, say the elders and pastor and church board, and they're, you know, we got to get things happening here, uh, Yep, we better, you know, this verse is offensive here to the unsaved, so we better, uh, ha- let's, let's call in some experts here, PR consulting firm, and have them come up with a slogan. So, here, so here's the slogan they paid for. Love God supremely and others sacrificially. wonder how much they paid for that. Love God supremely and others sacrificially sacrificially. And I could go on and on. These church slogans that they come up with are just, they sound pious, but they're, they're dumb, right? Okay. Um, then they painted the slogan in cursive letters in murals and on the walls. Well, we wouldn't want any verse from the Bible to be the theme, so they had to be more user-friendly and seeker-friendly. You know, God's word has to be written on our hearts. and the, We must be born again. That's the real problem. They're going to slap this new slogan they got on the, on the walls. and I mean, this stuff is so stupid, but, and, it, and it's wicked. It's sinful. Anyway, 
He, then she goes on, they lost their last two head pastors. One had an affair with one of the church secretaries that he was counseling. The other was forced to resign because he was so controlling and abusive. And now they've just hired a, I like how she puts this, they just hired a t-shirt and flannel, I'm wearing a flannel shirt, huh? and skinny jean wearing pastor who talks about God having a big table and open arms for this world in his introduction video basing his new his view on Isaiah 55. So you you, you know you can't have just a resume anymore, you know, when churches are looking for a pastor. You got you got to have an introduction video. He, that guy probably paid somebody to been put that together. And and so then he's going to he's going to preach a message that people are just going to think is just great. You know, God's got a big table. And he he's got open arms for the world. And here we go. So they they fall for it. They call him. This new pastor is directing the church, as he says, to be more woke, culturally sensitive. And uh, she said her friend left the church. Then at that point, that was enough. That was enough for her. And uh, let's see what else. They have a contemporary service in the gym with colored lights, black draping, cafe tables. Speakers the size of refrigerators, plural coffee bars, and a sermon from the 8 a.m. service, which was edited for time and splashed up on big screen projectors. Um, Then she goes on. But hey, at least they have a McDonald's-like play place. They have a weekend indoor soccer league, a dodgeball league, men's basketball league, a women's fitness program, a frisbee golf course, and a pickleball league, and an in-church Christian bookstore which has all the big-name preachers, books, veggie tales, DVDs, wind chimes, a fish to stick on the back of your minivan, and so on. They have free Christian counseling service, which she says re-traumatize my kids and I. And they have another campus in another city which meets in an old movie theater. So they have family-friendly movie nights with concessions. And they have a trailer stuffed with a bouncy house, a grill, a volleyball net, tables, chairs, small tent so people can rent it and have Christian outreach block parties and on and on and on. As you were talking about churches dying, it made me think of stars. Very often as stars die, they become bigger. They swell up and become a lot more active. And then comes the collapse. Or as Space.com says in How Do Stars Die, they become brighter and then they just sort of vaguely sputter out, becoming an inert, boring lump of helium and hydrogen, just hanging around the universe, minding nobody's business but their own. What a picture of Jesus removing the lampstand. So, very well put. That's exactly what was, had happened there at Laodicea. And it's all around. Laodicea is all around us today. It's, it's everywhere. Um, and a church, there's churches also. That we really need to take this message seriously because it's so easy to get on that Laodicean path. Um, you know, it's only the gospel that, let's see, what is it? Uh, is it Galatians 2.20? Check it out here. Um, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's verses like that and and like uh, when Paul says, um, when I came to you, maybe that's over in Corinthians, when I came to you, I, I knew nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. Now think this through. <clears throat> Does the Bible tell us anywhere that we are supposed to implement all of these 
world type um, programs and, and tailor our church and our message and sermons and so forth, our gospel, so that it's not an offense to the world. That's what this church, that's what she's talking about doing here. That's why they, they took that theme verse off of their publications and so on, uh, because they don't want to be an offense to the world. They don't want to. And that's what Laodicea did, and that's why they were so comfy and, and no persecution or anything. But a gospel like that isn't going to save anybody. And this kind of a thing then where people like the church at Laodicea did, you know, you say, I'm rich, I've prospered, I need nothing. Look at all that was happening here. Look at all we're doing. Really, there's moving and shaking here. And Jesus' evaluation of it is, you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked, and and, and I think this is a correct way to uh, think about when he says, I will spit you out of my mouth. Laodicea is sickening to Christ. It's, it's like he's writing to them. He says, you make me sick. You nauseate me. And, and you know, his words there are designed to, to really shake them up. And they needed it. A serious, a serious shaking up, right? Um, <clears throat> oh, here's another, that second email, a uh, little email that one of our friends wrote. Uh, I like how this is. Churches are getting bigger and God's getting smaller. <laughs> that, that's a good, there's a good slogan, right? It's true. Churches are getting bigger. God's getting smaller. He has left the majority of churches... And to make up for his having left them, they scramble around trying to come up with schemes that will stand in for him. She really puts this well. Churches in malls, auditoriums, stadiums, the congregation larger and larger, but there's no substance. They cannot create what's not there, God's spirit. No amount of jet planes for the pastor, buses to take people to and from the next performance, no play place, no sports or fitness program, no nothing will replace the Spirit of Christ which has departed from them. And that is the, that's the commentary on, on, on Laodicea, you see. And as I, I said, if you, if you had to pick one of these letters that characterized, characterizes the Christianity in America today and for Western Europe and so on, it would, it would have to be Laodicea, you see. Um, and at the heart of it is a failure to preach the gospel, to obey Christ, to tell people you must be born again and, uh, and, and preach Christ and Him crucified and stop compromising with the world. Of course the world's going to think, the world thinks that the gospel is foolishness. And if you're not willing, see, here's the problem with Laodicea. Laodicean Christians are not willing to be fools for Christ. They want to be popular with the world. They pretend that it's all, you know, in, for the cause of Christ, but it's not. It's not. They don't want to. They don't want to pay, the, pay the price. You see, so um, here then is um, Christ tells them, "I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire." So you say that you have gold, you don't. And of course, he's talking here about uh, spiritual treasure. This is like lay up your treasure in heaven. You guys are laying it up here on earth. You think you're rich. You're not because your heavenly bank account is empty. Buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. White garments. So that's a, a vision, of, a picture of uh, justification by faith, right? White garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see so that you're born again and the Spirit gives you the ability to 
to have eyes to see and ears to hear Christ's word and Christ's voice. And then after this stern, stern rebuke, he tells them, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. This is, this is the kind of an amazing thing to me. They, they are sickening to him in, in what they're doing. Uh, there's probably hardly any people there that are really born again. And yet what he's telling him here is, look, these are harsh words. But I'm telling you this now so that you can repent. You can be zealous and repent of your sin. And that reproof and discipline is a mark of my love. And uh, I think it's Matthew Henry that he, in his commentary, he says, you know, when, when Christ reproves and disciplines us, we need to recognize that it is, it is a mark of his love. And in fact, a father who won't discipline his child, right, doesn't love his child. And then here's this well-known verse, verse 20. <clears throat> Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. And so here <coughs> is a, uh, this, is re this is a call to repentance. Here he is, he's standing, right now, Laodicea, he's standing at the door of your church, and he's standing at the door of each one of you. And he's knocking, and he's asking for admittance. He's asking for repentance, right? And he promises anyone who repents, hears his voice, and, and repents, therefore opens the door, that he will come in, he will, and eat with him, he will have fellowship with him. But right now, the church at Laodicea, where is Christ? He's not, he's not in there with them. He's outside. And they've, you might say, put him outside, right? The one who conquers by repentance, right? I will, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so there you have it, the letters to the seven churches. And now in chapter 4, which we'll plan to pick up on next time, um, the door of heaven is going to be opened, and John's given this vision of the, the risen Christ. And, and, uh, and so we begin then at chapter 4, the the flow of the of the rest of the book and which is a description of events that are happening now in between Christ's first coming and his second coming in the in the church age so we'll plan to pick it up there then next time father thank you for this letter to Laodicea that you've recorded for us we pray that um, any strand of Laodicean that's in our own lives, any of this lukewarmness, that you would show it to us, that we would hate it and we would repent of it. We pray that we would be um, Christians who are genuine and on fire for you, serving you and obeying you no matter what the cost. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.